what do you guys think? And you don't have to describe it. You can just tell me what you think it is, um, uh, since I always seem to go over time. Where is this from? What's that? Well, there's bone. Um, <laughs> there's bone. Good. And there's a, it looks like mucosal epidermis. It kind of does, although it's a little bit of a trick. It is a, it is a specialized, unusual epidermis, but you're totally right that you can think absolutely of mucosa here because you have like the pale, vac uh, kind of glycogenated keratinocytes, no granular layer, but this is actually under the nail. So the bone is the little tiny clue, but otherwise, if you didn't know, if you hadn't, didn't know where it was from, I mean, that absolutely looks like mucosa right there. Good point. And there's more bone here. So sometimes it's hard to know, is the bone actually normal bone or is it new metaplastic bone? This bone's got like some little lamellar bone lines. So I bet this is part of the normal bone of the finger underneath the nail. So they got, they got really deep with this biopsy, man. So what would you think if you see this as a, you know, mass that's kind of destroying the nail and then underneath there's this. Yeah, so like a, a KA um, or a subungal KA. Yeah, right. So keratoacanthomas can occur in the nail bed. So subungal keratoacanthoma, of course, squamous, situ, or squamous cell carcinoma uh, in the differential. And as you guys know that usually in practice, I, I've been trained and uh, some other people agree with this and some disagree. But in any case, that, that um, it, to me, it's very hard to tell a true keratoacanthoma that's going to regress on its own from a squamous cell carcinoma that's well differentiated and, and keratoacanthoma-like. I've got a whole video about that. Um, this is an area of my view that's still evolving because I think it's complicated. And most of the time I just say squame KA type. And if uh, the dermatologist thinks that, that all, all keratoacanthomas are squames, then they're going to treat it. Others that think that you should manage keratoacanthoma differently and try, you know, more, you know, uh, alternative therapeutic options. Like I've heard of that you can inject them with like methotrexate and that they respond well um, or that you can watch and wait and see if they regress. Um, then other people will just disregard what I say. But these are the kinds of places where I do start thinking maybe there really is a role for like being cautious because a squame invasive under the fingernail um, is a chance that person's going to get a partial amputation of their digit, right? So um, these are the kind of times that if something really looks like a keratoid and thumb, it may be worth trying some alternative um, rather than aggressive surgery. So again, this is an area that I still find very challenging. But for keratoacanthoma under the nail, you do get these like kind of cystic, um, these, these cysts that are filled with keratin. The keratinocytes are very pale and glassy, have abundant, dense uh, pink cytoplasm. And there's not much in the way of nuclear atypia. Um, if I start seeing really ugly um, uh, atypical nuclei, uh, then I start being much more concerned about uh, true squamous cell carcinoma. But if I saw something like this, I would probably honestly be hedgy and, and say, well, I'm not totally sure, but this could be keratoacanthoma, especially because it's pretty rare to get a subungual biopsy where the entire lesion is intact and you can see the margins. I mean, that's usually what you get as a fragmented specimen like this because it's a very difficult place to remove something. So in any case, this was um, put in the study set. I don't, I don't know the history of this case, but as a subungual keratoacanthoma, and it is good to remember that they can occur at this unusual site, as can a variety of other tumors. All right.